So hi, everybody. If we haven't met before, my name is Jonathan Larson. I am an extension entomology specialist in the Department of Entomology here at UK. And I'm excited to be here to talk to you today about ticks. I wish it could be in person. It is something that I enjoy doing is uh, having those in-person meetings with all of the specialists and agents across the state. But today we're over Zoom. Hopefully we can still convey some of the same energy and hopefully show you some of the weird and creepy things about ticks that are in our state. So we like to call this, this talk, Check Your Crevices. This is something that me and a graduate student, Anna Pasternak, that we are hoping to expand across the state. We're hoping to do a lot more tick education and we're hoping that we're gonna be able to recruit some of you to help in those efforts here in the near future. But just to give you kind of a taste of some of the stuff you could be teaching about in the future, uh, I did wanna go over some of the basics of tick biology here. So ticks are a priority for our department. We receive a lot of inquiries every week, every month about ticks. I'm guessing that some of you get the same level of tick inquiries that we do. And there's lots of interest in the issues that they present for people and for animals in particular. There's a lot of interest in what these do to beef cattle, as well as what they do to horses in the state of Kentucky. I think that part of what drives this interest in ticks is one, they're creepy and gross. We can all admit that they do a weird thing by biting us and feeding on our blood. And because of the way they feed, they are a potential disease pathogen transfer agent. They can be a vector. And when they're vectoring these diseases, that's of high interest to the public. They wanna know more about Lyme disease. They wanna know more about things like the alpha-gal red meat allergy, which actually seems to be the number one kind of inquiry that I get about ticks is, what is the tick that's gonna make me allergic to hamburgers and take away steak from me? and people really wanna know how to protect themselves from that. That's obviously a staple of a lot of folks' diet, and they wanna know how to protect themselves. We've also recently seen a rise in interest on this invasive species, the Asian longhorned tick, which you can see in the left-hand image. That's an adult and an immature there. We'll talk more about why this is a weird tick and why it's important for the state of Kentucky here in a few minutes. But it seems like these are the things that are really kind of driving all of this interest and all of these questions about ticks. I think in Kentucky, we have specific interests in them because they are a threat to the equine and cattle industries. Kentucky has the largest cattle industry east of the Mississippi River. Ticks do get on cattle and they can impact the overall health and well being of the animal, kind of reduce weight gain, ultimately make the, the animal a little less valuable when you get to market. There's also, you'd have to discuss the effect of suffering on the animal, blood loss on the animal, and farmers aren't really interested in that. They want it to be a happy cow until they take it to market. So we gotta remember that that's out there. There's also a threat to our horses, a big million dollar industry here in the state of Kentucky. And the same thing is happening. These ticks get on horses and can stress them out and just make them overall have less of a, a happy well-being. So people are interested in making sure that doesn't happen on their property. We also have to consider some things that would be happening to people though. Ticks will affect things like ecotourism. They can also affect hunters and fishers people that are coming to the state of Kentucky to enjoy our natural beauty, to enjoy the game and the fish that we have here. We also have to think about outdoor workers. They all are going to be contending with ticks. And it seems like they're going to be contending with more and more ticks in their future. I've actually given a couple of talks now to different outdoor worker groups, including arborists and people who work on roadsides, trying to help them to understand how they can protect themselves from ticks because they could be walking into tick nests, for lack of a better word, any day of work and, and ending up with lots of these little blood suckers on their body. So ultimately what we wanna help people in the state understand is they want, we want them to know what species are located in what counties. And we wanna keep an eye out for where this invasive longhorn tick is in the state and where it's gonna be. Anna Pasternak, the graduate student that I mentioned, she gets a lot of ticks mailed to her from across the state. She's a really amazing master's student. She's also the only person that I've ever met that's excited to find ticks on her or to get ticks in the mail. I think that's a really weird postal delivery uh, option probably is to get blood suckers in the mail like that, but she gets dozens of them every week and opens up the little vials and is very excited to tabulate that data. So if you've got ticks coming into the office and you wanna send them in, she is still taking in samples. She receives them from agents and veterinary offices, lots of different places and it's helping her to build some websites and some material that we'll be using for teaching in the future. Now, in terms of tick biology, I like to cover just some of the basics because they are sort of confusing. They're sort of a weird thing, and people just know them as the thing that bites them. So 
just to kind of cover what it is that they're doing and why they do it. Ticks are what we call an ectoparasite. That means that they feed on the outside of the body. An endoparasite would be something that gets down inside of you like a tapeworm and is sucking out nutrients and being a parasite by being inside the body. But these ticks, they feed outside of the skin. They're plugging themselves in. They do feed on lots of different organisms in the environment. Some of them are specialists on birds. If you go down further south, we see them on lizards even. But around here, we mostly find them on mammals, and that includes us. Some of them will readily feed on a human if they get access to us. They go through three stages of life before becoming an adult. They start out as an egg. The egg is sort of in a pile out in the landscape. It will hatch, and out will hatch what we call a larval tick. Larval ticks are quite tiny. They only have six legs if you look at them under a microscope. And they are typically found on small mammals like mice at this point. I have an image of some in the ear of a mouse, and you can see them getting ready to plug in and start feeding there. When these end up on people, they're often called seed ticks because it looks like somebody has sprinkled the sesame seeds from a Big Mac all over your skin, and they're trying to plug into your skin and, and suck out your blood. So these do get on humans, but more commonly we find them on the smaller uh, mammals that are out in the landscape. After they feed on this animal, what they're going to do is drop off, crawl off into the grass, and they'll shed their exoskeleton and move to the next stage of life, which is called the nymphal tick. So as nymphs, they have eight legs. They are arachnids. It's kind of odd how they start life with six legs, but we see that with several different kinds of arachnids that they gain that eighth or that fourth pair of legs uh, later on in life. So the nymphal ticks have their eight legs, typically find them on slightly larger animals like rabbits. We see the rabbit in this picture has a few ticks couple on its nose, one on its ear. Sometimes when I give this talk in person, this is where people, they start to get really sad or they have like a little moment of heartbreak for the rabbit. Nobody ever feels bad for the mouse in the first image, but sometimes people feel bad for Peter Cottontail here in the second one. But you can see they're going to feed on this one, again drop off, molt their exoskeleton, and move into adulthood. As adults, they're typically found on larger animals. We find them on dogs a lot, humans. We also find them on cattle and deer and horses. Once they feed on this host, what they're gonna do is drop off and find one another and mate. Most ticks have sexual reproduction, so the males and females have to find each other in this big crazy landscape that we have. And once they do, they'll mate and the female will lay this big pile of eggs off in the grass and that will hatch the next year to start the cycle all over again. I have an image here in a little bit of the eggs. They're kind of interesting looking. They look like really cheap caviar. I think. I don't think they would taste quite the same. Though. Not that I've ever had caviar. So. <laughs> um, when we talk about how ticks feed, this is where people start to get interested because it's kind of weird that they live only on blood. They're hematophages. They survive by digesting blood from their host. They're just like Dracula. They're just like a vampire. They need the blood for sustenance. It isn't done just to annoy you. It actually helps them to grow. It helps the female to produce more eggs. And they're very adept at what they do. They're some of nature's best hematophages, I would say. They're some of our best ectoparasites. Some of the things that make them special, some of the things that make them successful, include their ability to expand their body. We've all probably heard the phrase, I'm as full as a tick. That's a phrase for a reason. You can see some fully engorged ticks there on the left. Those ticks started out about the size of a sunflower seed, about the thickness of a dime. But after feeding, probably for about 10 days on something, They've now swelled up to the size of a small blueberry, and they're just plum full of blood here in this picture. I like to joke that this is the newest flavor of fruit gusher. You can just pop it in and squish down on it and get that new iron rich flavor from this, uh, this candy company. But it's just really creepy how much they can fill up like a balloon with our blood or with our pet's blood. So that's one way that they're successful. They're able to really tank up on food. And that's important because they oftentimes don't find a host for a while. And when they feed, they need to get everything they need out of that one meal that they might need for the conceivable future because they can wait many, many months, even years in between hosts. They're lucky if they encounter a deer or something that they can climb aboard. So one of the other things that ticks can do is they can wait out these long lean periods. Some ticks have been recorded as surviving up to a year or a little over a year between hosts. So they're, they are kind of hard to kill even. Ticks can take a licking and keep on ticking is what we like to joke about. The other things that make them good at their job include their mouth. So their mouth is weird in that it's, de it's developed specifically to be an ectoparasite. And so what that means is that the tip of it 
if you look on the left there, we have a top view and a bottom view of a, of a tick's mouth. You can see the tip of it has these scissors that cut into the skin. They plug those into the skin. And then this, this hypostome, which is their tongue, it has all these backward facing spines on it so that when you try to pull the tick out, it gets stuck and it sort of tears at your flesh. They also produce a saliva that's sort of a natural cement and it anchors them into place. So they can remain attached to a host for seven to 10 days if left undisturbed. And I have had people who have found them crawling up out of their belly button 10 or so days after going hiking. So it's a long time that they're on you. It's hard to imagine that you wouldn't know that that's happening, but we often never find them during this feeding period, or we don't find them for a couple of days until we get into the shower after our long camping trip. And for animals, it's even tougher. They can't look over their entire body usually. So the tick just is kind of happily feeding in their armpit until they're ready to get off. In our state, we generally would say we have three primary tick species which impact human health. That is the black-legged tick, also known as the black-legged deer tick, or just the deer tick. You can see them in that first row there. We also have the lone star tick. Some folks call them uh, the turkey ticks or turkey mites in this part of the country. And then finally, the American dog tick in that last row, also known as a wood tick. In terms of their distribution across the country, each of these are an Eastern American species. The American dog tick is one of the more common species in the continental United States. The lone star tick is pretty widespread. You can see in the upper right map, it goes all the way up even into New England, but not quite as far into the Great Lakes and Midwestern regions as the American dog tick. The black-legged tick is the one with the most interesting distribution. It goes from Maine all the way down to Florida, but it doesn't really extend too far up into the Ohio and Indiana and Illinois area. We see more of them up further north in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan. So there's kind of a gap there for the black-legged tick. Unfortunately, in the past, we used to think of Kentucky as sort of being lacking in black-legged ticks, but some of the data that's coming out of Anna's work is showing how much they're really kind of moving into the state. But just to cover some of the basics of those ticks, the American dog tick is one of the more common ones. They live in these grassy areas by paths and trails. The adults are active April through August. And the diseases that we're most concerned with with this tick include the Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. So here you can see some of the differences between the males and females. They're both sort of seed shaped. They have sort of that teardrop shape to them. The female has this uh, ornate scutum, that collar that you see up close to her head. It looks sort of like a lace collar that she's draped around her. It's shorter than the male's scutum, which goes down his entire back. That's why he looks kind of like a Rorschach ink blot test. He has this hard shell that covers his whole body. Hers is shorter because she needs to be able to expand her body more to pick up more blood. These dog ticks, like I mentioned, they like grassy areas. They tend to be along roadways and walkways and trails where there's lots of traffic, and they tend to be questers. So they sit at the end of a blade of grass, they stick their arms out in front of them, and they wait for something to wander by, and then they give it their creepy little hug, and they kind of shimmy up the leg of that animal to find a place that they want to feed at. So you got to think about these as being at host height. Generally, that means from our knees down. They can be a little higher, but generally that's where we're going to find them start out on feet. This is their relative, the Lone Star Tick. They're also quite common. Anna's data seems to indicate this might be the most common tick encountered by people in the state of Kentucky. They're commonly found in and near wooded areas. The adults are also active April through August. They have a whole host of things that they can transmit, but the big one that we talk about with people nowadays is the red meat allergy. The Lone Star Tick is the tick that's responsible for transmitting the sugar molecule that creates the red meat allergy. Now they look a little different. They have longer mouth parts at the front of their body, which you can see in some of these images here. Their body is also rounder in shape. They have more of a hockey puck shape to themselves, especially when they're younger. The larva and nymph are quite round. The adult males and females are a little more elongated, but still very round in comparison to the dog. The main thing that separates this one is when you look at the female, she has that one white dot on her back. That's why they're called the Lone Star Tick. It's not because they like Walker, Texas Ranger. It's because of this one dot that they have on their back. Oh, by the way, those are the eggs that I mentioned before. You can see that they look like a little pile of, of caviar. They're kind of a brownish color and they're always laid in this big gooey pile. 
These are often found in wooded areas where there's dense undergrowth, and they're usually found kind of at ankle height. They will quest, but they'll also actively hunt after things. So you'll sometimes turn around, and if you wandered into an area with lots of Lone Star Ticks, they will be chasing after you like the walking dead. And you can end up with dozens of these on you at a time. In that left-hand image, that's a, a plastic bag that was brought into the office. And you can see there's some ticks down in the corner. If we zoom in, this was dozens of ticks that this person pulled off of their leg after they had wandered into it. I've had clients that have complained about even hundreds, and sometimes they seem to be using things like duct tape to remove all of them from their skin, which I assume also waxes the hair off of your body if you're not careful. But you can get lots of these on you. That leaves the black-legged tick, which is greatly feared for their association with Lyme disease. They feed mainly on white-tailed deer, so they live in forests. The adults are active on sort of an opposite schedule from the other two. They're active October through May on any day above freezing. They transmit Lyme, but they can also transmit things like anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and palisson virus. They have a unique coloration, particularly the adult female. She's kind of a reddish orange color. The male is more brown, but he has kind of a khaki horseshoe that goes over his body. And you can see that the larva and nymph, they're not very distinct at all. There's nothing really special about them. Most commonly, we're encountering that adult female in that orangey color, as well as the dark colored legs help to separate this species out from the others. They like to be where white-tailed deer are found, so hunters are encountering these frequently. Any day above freezing, even when we're deep in the winter, if it gets warm one day, these are crawling out and about. So if you're a hunter or a hiker, if, even if it's December or January, you're not safe from ticks. They can get active on any warmer day that we may be having. Typically are found about knee high on the tips of branches and low growing shrubs. The increase in Kentucky seems to be happening more and more. We're seeing black-legged ticks and getting reports of them. The belief that I've been told is happening is that there's a northern variant and then a southern variant of this tick. The northern variant is the one from New England. It seems to be the one that's moving into the state. And what that means is sort of not good news. The northern ones tend to stay above ground where there's people and where there's deer. The southern ones tend to get down in the leaf litter. They're used to escaping the heat. And so these northern ones are more likely to get on people and they're more likely to be possible vectors for Lyme disease. So that is a little bit of bad news for us, unfortunately. And then that brings me to the new tick on the block, this Asian longhorned tick. This is an invasive species. It's from Eastern Asia. It was accidentally introduced to the United States sometime before 2015. We're not exactly sure when, but it did get started in the state of New Jersey. It's been slowly moving since then. There have been four confirmed Kentucky reports. I can't find an updated map yet. That's got all of our reports. This one is a little outdated with just the two that used to happen. But this year, there were a couple of fines that were involved in Metcalf County. And one of them involved a domestic animal, uh, a bull in this case. So this tick is sort of moving across the country. You can see it's in multiple different states in the east, particularly in Virginia and New Jersey, up into New York and Connecticut. Also an interesting find out in Arkansas, which has me concerned about if that means that all of that territory between the tip of Arkansas and the tip of West Virginia or Tennessee is filled in with the tick as well. The reason that this is weird and that we have to talk about it is because of the way it reproduces. It only reproduces asexually. The female is sort of like an aphid. She can produce her own offspring without male sperm, and then she just lays hundreds of clones of herself, and they start to spread across the host that they're on, just like the aphids do on a plant, and they start sucking blood out and causing lots of issues for that animal. Thus far, there has not been any incidence of disease transmission with this species in the United States. It has been found that it cannot, I repeat, cannot vector Lyme disease at all. It could be a possible vector for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but we're not super worried about that at this point. It hasn't happened in the real world yet. What we're more worried about is when it gets on wildlife and on livestock. There have been two confirmed cases on people and multiple confirmed cases of them getting on livestock in Tennessee and other states and then actually exsanguinating the livestock. They actually drank so much blood from them that these animals bled to death into the ticks, basically. Um, that would be much less likely to happen on a person, of course, because we would be clearing our body of these parasites. But with an animal, they're not gonna have that capability. 
So it is something that could impact deer or elk or even black bear in the state. And it's ultimately going to confront our cattle industry and our equine industry. This is the potential distribution of the Asian longhorn tick. The darker an area is, the more likely it is that the tick will succeed there. And if you look closely at this, you will notice that apparently Kentucky will be the most popular destination for this tick. They're really looking forward to the bourbon trail and touring the horse farms and going out to the river and just seeing everything that our state has to offer. It looks like we're really in for an invasion by this tick if this map is accurate. So that's the, one of the other reasons that we're very concerned about where it is. And if you get any weird ticks brought to the office, we would love to hear about it and, and have that mailed to us. I'm running a little low on time, so I don't want to go through all of the diseases here today. I kind of can show you what we have here because this is sort of what you would be showing to people as you were teaching. If you were willing to use our tick packet that we're going to create, you'd be getting this presentation and some explanation of what to talk about with folks. But you would be covering things like Lyme disease, informing them about how long it takes for the tick to be on you before you pick it up, about the incidence increase of Lyme disease in the state of Kentucky, talking about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, also talking about red meat allergy. And I will share just a little bit about it since I know many of you are getting questions about it. This is something that's transmitted by Lone Star ticks. It's caused by a sugar molecule called alpha-gal. So because of that, it's often called the red meat allergy or the alpha-gal red meat allergy. What happens is the Lone Star tick feeds on a deer. It ingests this sugar molecule from the deer's blood. And then when it bites you, it gets into you and your body reacts to the molecule like an invader. And then the next time that you ingest the molecule into your stomach, your body has the same reaction. So it started in the blood, but then it moves into the digestive tract. And after this happens, you start to get an allergic reaction that occurs four to six hours after ingesting lamb or pork, beef or venison. Um, this is something that can happen instantly after being bitten by a Lone Star tick. It does not happen every time you're bitten by one. They may not have the molecule left in their saliva. They may have never encountered a deer before. And so because of that, it doesn't always happen. But if it does happen, this is the tick that did it to you. And then all of this, this meat that was in the image on the right is off the table for that person that has now been impacted by this allergy. So ultimately, I want to end by talking about how ticks are active year round. The high tick season was back in May and June. So that's when people need to be really aware. We try to promote multiple things for people to protect themselves from ticks. One of the simple measures of protection is to wear lighter colored clothing when you're going outside, to wear long sleeves and long pants, and to tuck your pants down into your socks. It does not look very fashionable, but it cuts off one of the easy access points that ticks have for moving up your leg, using it as a highway from your ankle to all of the other areas that they would like to feed. Ticks do like to go into the hair areas. They like to be in and around the ears. They like to be under the arms. They like inside of the belly button, around the waist, around the groin, behind the knees. Basically, if it's hairy and smelly and you don't normally show it off to other people, that's probably a spot that a tick would want to feed in. So check yourself every time you come in, even if it was just for a half hour outside doing some gardening, definitely check your body for ticks. Maybe even take a shower and check down in those spots. And always check your animals as well. They can pick up ticks. Sometimes dogs get a tick on them and the tick encounters that anti-tick medicine on the dog and they drop off. And now a tick is loose in your house and they're gonna maybe get up in your bed, the dog could. And then the tick is loose in your bed and you could wake up with an unwelcome surprise plugged into your body. We can also put skin applied insect repellents that we normally use for mosquitoes on, and those will help to repel ticks from biting us. DEET is the standby. The higher percentage of DEET that's in the product from 20 up to 100%, the longer it's gonna last. Some people prefer other things like picaridin or IR3535 or oil of lemon eucalyptus. All of these can help for multiple hours to repel ticks and mosquitoes from getting on your body. But the ultimate in tick protection is permethrin. It is an insecticide, so it's only applied to clothes or to gear that you're taking with you into wooded areas. It's something that kills mosquitoes and ticks when they crawl across it, so you don't apply it to your skin. This is something that you can do yourself, buying a spray bottle like you see on the left and treating clothing. You can also buy permethrin impregnated clothes and then use those uh, for multiple washes, and you'll be protected from these bites. 
The other thing that I hope that you can help to spread the word about is how to remove an embedded tick. It involves tweezers. You get as close to your skin as possible. You grip the tick and you pull steadily upward. You don't yank it out. You don't wiggle it out. I've seen lots of people bring in this thing called a tick twister, which while it's alliterative and interesting looking is the worst possible thing that you could do. You're supposed to put it over the top of the tick and then you spin it around really fast until the tick is like wound out like a corkscrew. And you're just gonna be breaking tick pieces off into your body, causing an infection situation, and overall not having a good time. So pull it steadily out of your skin like that. Do not use fire, don't use alcohol or essential oils to kill the tick first, because when you pour those on or poke it with the lit match, the tick is very likely to vomit into you. And when it does that, you're increasing the likelihood that pathogens will move from the tick's body and from the back of its gut into your blood and you could possibly end up sick. So this is Anna, she's the one that's working on ticks. We're hoping to work on ticks together for the next year or so. And we're hoping that we're gonna put together a big packet, a digital packet that we'll distribute to all agents who are interested. And it would even come with the, uh, a little tick collection. Anna has lots of spare ticks. So you would have teaching ticks that you could take with you when you did events, once we can do them in person again. If that's something that you're interested in, I hope that you'll let us know. And I've got my contact information here. Um, if you want to tweet at me, I'm at bugmanjohn. That's my email address there, jonathan.larson at uky.edu. But this is something that we had hoped to do this year and it kind of got corona. But at this point, we're starting to plan again and we're hopeful that it will take off in 2021. That we'll be doing this big tick education effort across the state. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm happy to take any questions that we may have.